All right. Hello, everybody. This is James dealing with Daily Effects. Just wanted to do a quick sound check. So if you can hear my voice, please type in a Y. All right. Beautiful. Looks like we have a minimum of a delay here on the audiovisual feed. Just want to thank everybody very much for your time in advance. Uh, I'm going to cut right to the chase because it's been a really busy past 24 hours. And uh, odds are the longer I talk, the more matters are moved. So I want to get those live charts up as soon as possible. Um, first, I want to thank you for your time in advance. Um, as I mentioned, there are quite a few different themes and scenarios to be talking about today. Yesterday's FOMC rate decision brought out a big move in the euro dollar. Uh, also the US dollar, also gold prices and many markets that are linked thereof. Um, also stocks though, I mean, net reaction to yesterday was a quick dip followed by an aggressive rip that's shown through so far today. So uh, as I said, let's just uh, get right onto those live charts. As usual, this webinar is all about you. So setups you have, repairs you want to take a look at, go ahead and fire those my way. I'll do my absolute best to answer those when we get to the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, need to go through a risk disclaimer first and foremost, which is available here. I'm going to leave that up for about 15 seconds and then we will proceed on those live charts. All right, time to make this happen. Just uh, getting the background set up there. There we go. Okay, so as mentioned, the big focal point yesterday, US dollar. Um, let me draw back to a chart that has quite a bit less going on so that we can really focus in on what that movement was and and what's been taking place around it. So we've talked about this numerous times already. Resistance inflection earlier in the month. Really interesting backdrop here because that top side rip in USD, I mean, it really came from that ECB rate decision. ECB announced a fresh round of TLTROs, quick support break in Euro dollar, and a quick top side test here in USD. It retested this level around 97.70, 97.71. The NFP report the day after wasn't very good, or at least the headline number wasn't very good. 20K versus an expectation of 180. Dollar weakness comes in, and that theme largely remained all the way into yesterday's FOMC rate decision. Now, FOMC yesterday, the general take was that the bank was quite a bit less than before. Previously, the Fed had forecast, I believe it was two rate hikes for 2019. Yesterday, they said zero. And then they also said only one for 2020. So quite a bit more dovish than what many were looking for. And the immediate response here was US dollar weakness. Notice there, 1300, two o'clock, right during the FOMC statement release. This thing went down and tested a big level of support. Now we looked at this level of support on Tuesday. Taking a step back, it's coming from the 9582 swing low that had held the lows here on the last day of February which projects to around that trend line projection, projects to a projection uh, that emanates from the September low to the January swing low, right? So the past two weeks of price action, despite getting two very different, starkly contrasting trends in USD, has essentially been traversing the range between this ascending triangle formation. The triangle is still holding, and this still keeps eyes on top side bullish breakouts in anticipation that the same motivation that has continued to drive in bulls at higher lows, just like we saw yesterday, may eventually hold until we could take out that horizontal level of resistance at 97.71. Now with that being said, the devil's in the details, and there was some brutal movement in this theme around that rate decision. I'm going to draw down here to an hourly chart now so we can really focus on what had happened uh, with some annotations that have been following here in these webinars. There's that quick dip lower. There's that trend line test. Since then, prices have buckled back up, higher highs, higher lows on a short-term basis, and that theme has remained into this morning. Prices have popped back above the 96.47 prior support level, prior resistance level. And on a shorter term basis, this does look as though it has the aim of continuation. Now, with that said, I generally want to try to keep a balanced approach here around the US dollar. Uh, very similar to what I had said on Tuesday. On Tuesday, I shared with you that I was going into this rate decision with a bullish bias, which is somewhat rare for me. I'm usually gonna remain pretty balanced around USD, but 
this is a good illustration as to why. Those biases can sometimes play out, but it can be so dangerous building your entire strategy or approach around them. So even though I did have that bullish bias in USD going into FOMC, I still made sure that I had USD weakness set up so that if the alternative scenario took place, which it did, then I would have something that could still work. But now the prices have broken through or tested through those prior support levels. Bulls are back in play. And the door is reopened for topside strategies in USD. Now, I have a few pairs that I like for continuation of weakness, similar to what we have seen over the last week and a half, well, two weeks now, uh, since that NFP report earlier this month. And then I have a couple of areas where I'm still pretty interested in USD strength. The longer term backdrop, we have not yet broken through the impasse that's been holding over the past few months, largely because the dollar has stuck within this ascending triangle. And then if we take a look over at a related market, a related pair in Euro dollar, you can see that that range that's been holding here, it also has not yet died. Yesterday's FOMC rate decision, that quick rush of USD weakness, helped to provide a real strong move here into Euro dollar. Let's get down a little bit tighter so we can really focus on that. There we go. P says, wasn't it a slightly lower low though? Yeah, it was, it was. It just barely squeaked down and then it popped right back up. So on a closed basis, I didn't have any candles intersecting through that support. It was largely just a, a bounce with the wick that had probed through and then found new buyers. Um, to make this, or to go back to a recent example, dollar yen, remember that theme of capitulation we looked at just a few weeks ago? That quick wick tested above resistance, but sellers came right back in. So this wasn't quite a pin bar or a Pinocchio bar, but it had a similar kind of backdrop where prices probed up to a fresh high and that ended up eliciting more sellers. They were then able to re-grab control, break through support, and then move prices back down towards that 11086 support level. Uh, but getting back to Euro dollar. Uh, that's the one I want. Okay. So that's the FOMC rush. Right. And drawing this back, that equation that we had around USD, the ECB rate decision earlier this month, there's that quick support test, a breakthrough, a temporary breach through the bottom of that prior range. Bears had maybe about 40 or 50 pips of run thereafter. And that's when this Fibonacci level came into play. That's the 61.8% retracement of the 2017-2018 major move. And then the NFP report came in and prices in Euro dollar have continued to rally all the way until we just kissed off the bottom side of that longer term range formation. So I'm going to scroll back here to a four hour chart. Remember the range that we were looking at for months that runs between 1448, 15 on the resistance side, and then on the support side between 13 and 112, 112, 15, 112, 13, up to 113. Prices have worked right back into that range. So on this one, I want to do this a little bit differently today, uh, rather than just assigning it a direct bias, because I really do think this one could cut either way. I think for traders that are looking at this on a longer term basis, the short side swing is likely going to be more attractive. If we can scroll out here to a daily chart. You can see a really strong resistance rejection right at that level. Let me get rid of these trend lines so they don't obfuscate the look. There we go. Really strong reaction after probing and testing that trend line. If traders look at stops above that level, we're talking a little over 100 pips, which could be justified for traders that are comfortable taking prices back down to the bottom side of support around 112 and a quarter, 112 15. 112 and a quarter is about 122 pips away. So a slightly better than one to one risk reward ratio on stops above the high. And this could also be linked with that USD setup for traders that do want to see the dollar or do expect the dollar to go back up, retest that 9771 level. Then this appears to be rather linked with a retest of a support in Euro dollar around those 112 or maybe even 111.86 uh, level that helped to bring in that swing low earlier this month right in there. So that's the longer term look, like I said, would probably be more attractive to those that are looking at swing trading strategies or swing strategies. On a shorter term basis, I do think that there is a backdrop that could justify bullish positions. Now, granted, prices have tumbled very, very aggressively since the, the test of that resistance 
again, around 114.48. Um, but this is where I could bring in that trend line I was looking at a moment ago, right in there, to try to see if some type of support develops anytime soon. Use this as somewhat of a meter, if you will. If prices break back above, then I could get the idea that buyers are getting back in order, or coming back into play. Uh, a real quick little shorthand that could be used for something like this. Draw Fibonacci retracement around that move itself. So I'm essentially spanning from the ECB low up to the FOMC high. And notice that right now we're testing the 38.2% retracement of that major move. And then this prior zone that I was following that runs between around 113.10 up to around 113.30, we could just extend that. And that's around the 50% marker of that major move. And so for short-term strategies, I could essentially look at that as a line in the sand. And as long as buyers are able to return ahead of that level, then I'd start to, or be able to start to justify bullish euro dollar positions. And again, it would be a shorter term basis looking for the same strength as played out to continue. Now, I know that a lot of folks are looking at the euro right now. ECB just did a fresh round of TLTROs. Cut growth forecast massively. And yeah, that makes a very compelling argument for short side Euro plays. But I mean, it was just 2017, 2018 when this thing put in a magnificent rally, even amidst a fairly unattractive economic backdrop, right? So what price is telling us could be more important than what intuition or projections are telling us, even though the ECB just laid in another round of fresh QE. Uh, but that's what I'm looking at on Euro dollar. This one could cut both ways. Um, retest the range resistance, longer term. Doors open for short side swings on a shorter term basis. The potential for bullish continuation, it's still there as long as we remain above the 50% marker of this recent major move. That's what I'm looking at in the Euro. All right, dollar yen. So this was previously my favorite play for USD strength, and I think I'm going to shift out of that stance. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons, which I'll be happy to explain here. So prices have held February support. If you remember that 11030 level that I was looking at last month, it did help. It did come in to help hold the lows after that sell-off following FOMC yesterday. And you can already, I think, get an idea of why I would have difficulty shifting back into a, a bullish backdrop here. Prices have just rallied up to and are finding resistance off of prior support around that 11086 Fibonacci level. And then if we take a step back, I can still make the case that this thing is relatively overbought on a near-term basis because this topside trend since January came in so smooth. And just like I said in, in, in the U.S. dollar a little earlier, um, when prices go through and break those prior support swings, it's likely going to take out some stops, stops on long positions, meaning there's more money on the sidelines to jump back in if a bullish case could be re-argued, if you will. But you can see by the aggressive slope on this trend line and the fact that we'd held it all the way into yesterday, it did have that overbought feeling to it. And then that 112 resistance, it was too imposing, apparently, as buyers just would not wiggle up for another test. So at this stage, it does look a bit more bearish to me than what I'd want to see for bullish USD scenarios, uh, largely on the basis of resistance holding at prior support, prices jumping down or, or running down to a fresh near-term low, even though we did have a quick probe below that. Um, but this would be one that I wouldn't want to follow for strength until I had more information that buyers are going to be able to come back into play and maybe even take out that 112 resistance level. I don't feel good enough about 110.30 to say that this is the low just yet. Um, I think the max pain trade here would be an extension below that low, i.e. taking out more stops, resetting sentiment around dollar yen. And then looking for something around this trend line to the prior support zone that runs between 109.67 up to 110 flat. I think that's something that could get retail to start looking on the short side of the move. And then that's something that could make it attractive to me on the long side of the move. Clearing out more of those stops, running down to a quick trend line support test that could be coupled with that prior support zone 109.67, 110. 
and then looking for upside in an eventual test above 112. Yeah, Pete with a with a big note here. Can't deny the yen strength at the moment. And and this is something else, another market theme that's that's fairly pervasive, although it might not be so interesting to many of the attendees right now. Uh, so I'll save it for a little bit later and just focus on FX in the interim. But stocks and bonds, right? Rarely do those two markets move in tandem. And when they do, it's often bonds that are right. And then stocks end up playing catch up. It, kind of the same with dollar yen, right? If this was tr a, a truly exuberant US dollar rally, as traders were getting amped up for rate hike bets out of the US or tighter policy ops, whatever. If this was a true USD rally, then one would imagine that dollar yen would just have continued up through resistance. It didn't. It's on its back foot, broke down, retested February lows. Not something that should be summarily dismissed at the very least. Uh, so yeah, that's where I'm at on dollar yen. Not ready to look for bullish continuation. If anything, might want to start lining up some short-term bearish swing setups. Not a ton of distance down to that 110.30. If I was setting this up for short side positions, I'd want to look at that as the initial target, and then I'd want to factor the trade off of that. All right, moving on. Okay, so one pair that does still hold some attraction for dollar weakness strategies, in my opinion, is right in here, dollar yuan. It's a market I've been following since last November. Uh, prices came perilously close to the all-time high right around 698.75. And at that point in November, I think it was like the second week of November, I started to look for reversals in the pair. And that reversal theme has played out fairly well so far. In the past couple of weeks, I've kept this on the blotter in uh, FX setups as one of my short side USD setups. Two targets, 670 and 667.50, uh, both of which have been hit so far this week. And now prices are bouncing. The reason I think this can remain attractive for short side USD strategies is twofold. One, there's a good area of technical resistance just very, very nearby right now. And I could even call this uh, confluent resistance as we have the trend line from that bearish channel. And we also have this prior area of swing resistance around 7.20, uh, 672.25. So just a stone's throw away from where we're at right now. That prior resistance was also previous support. And at the very least, there's close proximity to a line in the sand that I could draw where I know that I'm wrong and I could bail out quick if this theme does eventually end up snapping or breaking. Um, but so far, that bearish structure still remains on the four hour chart. And if I'm looking to, in essence, take advantage of this dollar strength today so that I can fade the move, this is going to remain a pretty compelling argument, a pretty compelling market to continue to follow. Dollar, you won. All right. I was going to do commodities later, but let's just go ahead and cut to the chase because this was a really big move. Gold prices. So in the webinar Tuesday, I looked at this as one of the more attractive areas to be plotting for short side USD strategies. And this thing broke out and played through very, very cleanly. Um, so earlier in the day, there was reports of a huge sale in gold. Uh, I think it was like a billion dollars worth of gold was sold in, I think, London might have that incorrect, but that gave a quick move lower. And you can see where that bearish trend line came in as projected support. But FOMC, as that dollar weakness was pricing in, gold prices caught a bid, ran, and went right up to the breakout target around that 1320 confluent area of Fibonacci resistance. That held the highs. Prices have since reversed and erased almost the entirety of the move. But I'm going to go down even tighter here. You can see where buyers have again reacted to that Fibonacci support level around 1303.02. So to my eyes, this one is just basically trading on the other side of the dollar right now. But if what Pete and I have been talking about, that yen strength component, along with strength in bond prices, along with the quote unquote or potential quote unquote melt up in equities, this could be a pretty interesting risk aversion market or a market to plot for continued risk aversion. The big question now is whether buyers are going to be able to hold these lows after that USD strength has roared so aggressively. 
if we do see a continued hold of the lows, then we may have fresh bullish trends to work with. Go down to like a two hour chart. We need to see that prior swing low. We need to see that hold between 1298 and 13. And if it does, door remains open for bullish continuation. To set this one up on the short side, I do think it would be a bit challenging considering that we still do have that bullish backdrop. But if prices pierce below that swing, basically go out to the daily, there we go. If we pierce through that low, then you can even see here just after taking a step back where that Fibonacci resistance came in to hold the highs and a break through that low opens the door for a retest to 1292, 1286, or perhaps even that 1275 level that makes up the bottom side, 1276 level, excuse me, that makes up the bottom side of that support zone that's been holding since February, since January, since the opening of the year. But it was a fast and furious moving gold. And that thing came off very, very quickly. Just holding at that Fibonacci level right now. Yeah, and let me show you guys where that uh, where that Fib's coming from. I have two on here. They're both in green, very thin. Uh, the first retracement, I'm taking the August 2018 low, and I'm drawing that up to the February 19, February 2019 swing high. And then the shorter term move is right in here. It's basically just the 2019 move from the 2019 swing low to the 2019 swing high. There, I'll make that second one orange so we can tell which level is which. There we go. And you can see it's coming from that 38.2 on that second retracement, marking the 2019 major move. Okay, back into FX land. Now, this one is somewhat linked to gold, Aussie dollar. All right, so I kept this one on the short side USD uh, side of the ledger for this week. That bounce from 70 continued, and it looked real nice when I walked into the office this morning, but that niceness has continued to dissipate throughout the day today. Now, I'm at somewhat of a loss here as to how I could justify short side positions at this point. You can see it's already put in a fairly strong move off of that, that high earlier this morning. I mean, we're talking about 70, 80 pips uh, worth of pullback. Longer term, I like resistance back in this zone that runs between 7185, 7206. So if we get a revisit there, I could start looking for sellers re-entering the equation. And then I can start looking at fade plays to try to take this thing back down towards that 70 big figure. But for right now, the only thing that's really jumping out at me is looking for a continuation of higher low support and a hold above, let's call it around or above this zone that runs between 7066 and 7075. If I get that, I can look for stops below 70 and a half and then look for prices to revert back towards 71.25, 71.50. The short side of this one, like I said, would be a bit more challenging to me right now. But if prices are able to rally back into that resistance zone, i.e. a quick rush of dollar weakness or a return of dollar weakness, then that's where I could start to plot for dollar strength strategies back in Aussie. Kiwi dollar. Another another big move here. <laughs> All right. So first and foremost, that 68.70, 68.77 zone we've been following, it did hold another resistance inflection through yesterday. Uh, prices had dipped down. And then as that dollar weakness came in around the Fed, strong top side pop. Prices moved up all the way towards that 69.50 level, weren't able to hold. And then resistance ultimately ended up building around that February swing high. Now, we could even see where the pullback from that move is now catching support at a prior trend line projection. So at this point on shorter term strategies, I could look for bullish continuation, retest around those prior highs. I would likely want to nest the stop in around 69 and a quarter rather than getting so greedy as to look for a reprint of 69.40. Just in the event that prices come up, can't quite make that stretch, and then they turn around again. But... If I know a target that I could factor to, again, 69 and a quarter, there's approximately 60 pips of possible upside there from current price right now, assuming 68, 65, which means if I could fit in for 30 or 40, then I could look at a one to 1 1.5 or one to two risk reward ratio. And something like that could be relatively attractive. Now, just underneath prices, this one is about 40 pips away at 68 and a quarter. 
That was the prior zone of swing lows that had come in in the overnight session. On a longer term basis, and you'll probably notice that this theme is, is rather thematic throughout many of these USD pairs. And the reason is because there's a big commonality, USD. But on a longer term look, I think the strategy for, for, for weakness could be more easily justified incorporating this longer term bearish trend line. Now, this originates in June of 2018, connects here in December of 2018, projected on and did a great job of catching the January, February highs. And then the way that yesterday's rally had softened just inside of that makes a compelling case for a resistance hold on that longer term basis. Now, this one, of course, being a longer term setup, stop would need to be a bit wider. Profit target would be, need to be a lot wider. OK, so a couple of different options here. Most aggressive would be looking at a stop above yesterday's high, which is i.e. about 40 pips. Excuse me, about 80 pips rather. So can I look for 120 to 150 on the upside if I'm right? That means I need to go down to about 6740 just inside of that prior swing low for that initial short side profit target. But again, that'd be a relatively tight stop just going above that, that high that it printed yesterday. A bit deeper on 69.65, also an option. It's the December swing high. But now we're looking at 100 pips of risk. Is there a reasonable approach that could look for 150 to 200? That gets a bit more of a stretch. If we go down to that 67.20 level, we're talking 140 pips of upside potential. If we get that, we also have a trend line break from the symmetrical wedge that's been building over the past nine months. And in that case, could possibly justify a deeper move back down towards the 65s. So again, this one can cut both ways based on the periodicity with which the trader is basing their assumptions and building their strategy. Um, the longer term swing here looks more attractive to me, but End of the day, those short time, uh, those short term moves, very workable as well. When I do get in one of those situations, it is possible to trade the short term move until it either fails or meets completion. At which point, the longer term case could be reevaluated. As in, if I trade a short term move of strength, prices run up, retest that resistance, pull back, and show me higher low support. Well, then we'd also have a topside break of that bearish trend line, thereby negating the symmetrical, uh, symmetrical wedge formation and then reopening the door for a retest of the 70 big figure. So a couple of different ways that this one can be approached right now. All right, here's a great question, Richard. I'm going to take this in the midst of these setups. I have a few more that I wanted to go over, but this is very relevant to the discussion that we have right now. Um, for Mr. Richard Heath, looks like seesaw price, action after, uh, seesaw price action after yesterday's Fed minutes. Does this make you hesitate on entering positions, or do you think this action offers opportunity? I do. I generally keep an assumption that I never know what's going to happen next with price. The whole reason for using analysis is to try to fit in decent risk reward ratio so that I could try to get the odds, my perceived odds at least, or my inferred odds in my favor just a little bit. But when we're in one of these situations like we're in right now where something appears to be shifting under the hood, then I'm basically going to assume that my analysis is going to work less often which means that it would need to be offset, that lower probability of success would need to be offset by stronger risk reward ratios. So in essence, adopting a bit more of breakout style trade management, quicker break even stop, more aggressive profit targets versus tighter stops, and just playing it a lot more defensively. But in all honesty, if I thought there wasn't anything workable here, that's exactly what I would say on the webinar. I just don't sideline myself that often because I assume that that markets are going to be somewhat chaotic. And when that chaos increases a little bit, I take a step back. I just look for stronger risk reward ratios and assume a lower probability of success on each individual setup that I'm taking. Uh, but yeah, there's some setups here or some markets where 
I just want to steer clear. Um, like for instance, dollar cat. I have this one on the blotter, but frankly, I don't know what in the world to do with it right now. Uh, early portion of this week, this thing moved beautifully for me. Uh, I was using this resistance zone, 3361, 3385. That was from Friday, but that one came in uh, on Monday. Resistance holds, quick dip down to support, cleared the first target, bingo, bango, beautiful. Uh, came up, even had another support test yesterday, just after FOMC. And then this thing has put in a vicious topside rally. So at this point, rather at the point 40 minutes ago, when I was getting ready for the webinar, prices were bubbling just above that resistance zone. It was just inside of that prior swing low. And I was just simply in a spot where I couldn't justify anything. Um, with price having not shown any near-term resistance yet, I'd have a hard time plotting swings with stops above that prior swing high around 34.70. And on the other hand, I mean, that prior swing was all the way down to 32.50. And if prices are above 33.85, I mean, we're talking like 140, 150 pips worth of a stop. And then, I mean, we're, you know, less than 100 away from the top. So I really couldn't justify anything on either side of it. So that's why I haven't looked at dollar cad until now when the question came up. Um, but now that we have it on, and now that we're getting a bit of, of run off the top side of that resistance zone, let's look at how we could work with that. Just taking a step back and trying to get a bit more data into the matter. Okay. So for some reason, and I got a couple of different Fibonacci levels in here, but for some reason, this zone has continued to remain as pertinent in dollar CAD. Uh, strong resistance inflection in late January. Notice there was even a few days of grind in that zone. And that's where you could tell the resistance level is really strong because buyers are just continuing to push, continuing to push, continuing to push. Here, you could play it out on like a two hour chart. And they're just getting nowhere real fast. It's kind of like driving a rear wheel car in the mud. Good luck, right? Pressing the gas as much as you want. That's just going to create more of a mess. And that's kind of what was happening to buyers here. They, you know, kept pressing on gas. Sellers like, where are you going, dude? Where are you going? Where are you going? Until eventually buyers are like, whoa, I don't want to fight that one. And then price builds in a nice retracement. Um, that zone came back just last week. And then again, earlier this week. If that bearish response continues, so that by the end of the day, I could say, you know what? Not only was that zone real strong, it got those buyers that had pushed all the way up to 34. It pulled them back down below support. I mean, if if today closes below 3361, that's going to look like a beautiful resistance swing. And then I could start to justify stops above 3470 and look for a deeper move here in dollar CAD. But yeah, this is one that's going to need to fill in a little bit more before I could do anything interesting with it. All right, I've went way too long. Let's just cut through a couple of more pairs and then I'll uh, start taking some questions. Swissy, <laughs> let's talk about levels that are just coming back into play for no good reason. No, I say no good reason. There's a reason we're looking at it. It's the 61.8% retracement of a long-term move here in, in dollar Swiss. Uh, this is the same level that it held the lows in late January. Prices are back, getting a bounce. Four hour chart, you could see where again there was a considerable grind as sellers were trying to push through, trying to push through, trying to push through. They're just getting nowhere really fast. They're just spinning their wheels in mud. Now we have a bit of a corrective move this building in. For short side strategies, a retest of resistance right within this range that runs between 99.82 and parity can be an attractive thesis to work with. The long side could be a bit more challenging. At this stage, considering that that reversal is already stretched a bit and the stops would need to go more than 50 pips off a of current market price, which could just barely be offset by a reprint of parity. To justify this on a longer term basis, I think one would need to go back to the daily or longer and largely look at this as just a swing trade with a return to parity. Stops go to break even and then see if we get a retest in that deeper resistance zone that runs between 10071 and 10096. That's Swissy. All right, let's look at some stocks. Because motion creates emotion, and that's what they've been doing. Okay, so 
in, in the last webinar, I looked at that support zone that runs around that 2820 level. And if we look at yesterday's price action, I mean, that was a nasty spill that stocks took into the close. And then overnight futures saw the SP just continue to sell off. But when we opened this morning around the US equity open, I mean, this was just like a rocket launching into the atmosphere. Now, we're so far away from that prior swing load, there's not much that I could do for bullish continuation here. It's simply going to be too costly. We're talking about 40 to 50 handles of risk, which would mean I'd want to see 75 to 100 of potential to make that worth my while. Go out to a daily chart, you see we'd have to shred through some rarefied air to get back up there. If we get back up to the high at 29.43, there could be 100 handles of upside, which would be great. But... Again, this move is already kind of stretched. Is there, are there enough bulls on the sidelines to provoke such a move without a modicum of a pullback? I don't think there is. I mean, in my opinion, because this thing already felt stretched. I think the item to watch for right now is that swing high that had come in last week. I think that's a very interesting resistance or level of potential resistance for a couple of different reasons. If you look at this uh, previously bullish trend line that connects the late January to February swing lows, that projection is what helped to catch that high on Tuesday, just before stocks started to tumble, right when we started the webinar. And then prices ran down, caught support, even after breaking to a fresh short-term low, and now we have that bounce. Question I have, are we gonna see sellers come back into play here? Because once we get up there, it's a very logical area for bulls to start taking off some risk and start managing off some winning trades. That's automatically gonna slow, it's automatically gonna slow action on the bid. If we could also couple that with the return of bears, there might be a, a quick door opening for short side swings in the S&P looking for prices to return back down towards that 2820 level. Dow Jones, this one's actually worked a little cleaner with the level that I've been following. I published an article earlier this week, uh, Tuesday, actually, just before we started the webinar. And I had uh, called alarm to the golden uh, cross that it just showed in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And the ultimate conclusion, at least in the article that I published, is just continue to play levels. Now, that's right around when the Golden Cross had printed. Again, it was 1 o'clock on Tuesday, right before our webinar, and that thing started to roll over. Since then, prices broke down, caught support in the S2 zone, rallied up. Earlier, we're finding resistance in the previous S1 zone, but this is kind of like a less emphatic S&P 500, right? While the S&P 500 is bursting up to fresh 2019 highs, the Dow is still somewhat subdued. And largely because of Boeing. There's still that Boeing risk. Only 30 companies in the US 30. Boeing is like 11.5%. I think it's 11.4% of the, the, the Dow's composition. So that's basically like a weight around its neck right now. But going back to what I was looking at in the S&P 500, where stocks might be a little bit stretched, might be due for a deeper pullback, the Dow would probably be a bit more attractive for that theme given that it hasn't put in more of an amplified bullish response over the past couple of weeks. So that if we are going to see U.S. equities begin to tip over, begin to tip over because it has been a very strong quarter so far, we can start plotting it in the one that's been a little bit weaker. It's kind of like those nature videos. When you see a lion hunting a pack of hyena, which one do they go after? The one they can catch. Well, it's kind of like that in the Dow. If you're looking to get short, maybe the index that hasn't been so bullish to where it's continued to break up to fresh 2019 highs or, or towards 2019 highs is the one you want to pick on. And that, my friends, is what I have for today. Let me know what kind of questions are on your mind, and I'll do my best to answer them. <laughs> From Pete, wow, was that a clean reversal off the lower trend line? Man. Yeah, it was it was something. Um, but I had spoken with Marina a little earlier on Twitter. She had asked me, or uh, she brought up a couple of couple of couple of good points here. Um, uh, you know, regarding how clean the setup looked, 
and it, it kind of goes to a tweet that I had uh, responded to uh, uh, with Pete yesterday. Um, you know, we were looking at that, and like I was saying, I mean, this is a real tricky area here on the dollar. I mean, trap-like tricky because we had this prior swing low at 95.82, which is barely squeaked below it. And when it squeaked below it, it was like right in the mayhem of the press conference, right when prices are moving really fast, right when everything is, you know, focused on the Fed. You can even see it on like a one minute chart. This was not a move that took its time. It was just a fast, violent penetration followed by two way price action that expands and eventually bulls take over. But you remember megaphones? Like we've looked at those in the past. I don't usually look at them on longer term setups, but that's a good indication that support is coming in and that volatility is expanding and getting ready to make a big move in one direction or the other. And it's largely continued. But uh, what Marina was looking at a little earlier, she's like, hey, it's just very clean, don't you think? And I was like, yeah, it's almost too clean for comfort. And when there's something that appears too good to be true, I start looking at the other way, how it might be false. So you know, I do think there's an argument to be made here for this being a bull trap. Just got to watch those prior support levels to see if sellers come in for resistance. Um, my anticipation at this point is that tomorrow will hopefully be quiet. I expect it to be a, at least quieter. Um, but that's where we could start to see tonality and in, in, in which of these moves might have some actual continuation potential. Uh, from Marina, pretty happy to have studied your charts in the last webinar. Amazing, sir. Thank you for providing it and share with share with us your precious knowledge. It's absolutely my pleasure to help. I remember when I started learning this stuff, there there weren't any good resources really. I mean, there was message boards back in the day. Um, I remember Raging Bull was a big message board when I started trading, and I mean, it was mostly just you know spam or you know. Folks that didn't know what they were doing to try to present it as such, but that's what got me looking at charts and technical analysis, um, you know. And and uh, you know, so when I started doing this stuff, I was like, well, hey, what would I have wanted ten years ago, and how can I make that happen for people? Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be able to do that stuff with you, ladies and gentlemen, every day of the week. Thank you, Pete. Your charts are so incredibly clean. Yeah, I mean, you saw the haircut, right? I'm Mr. Clean over here. <laughs> Bad joke. Yeah, my wife has this um, thing where she's been constantly criticizing me that my sense of humor has went <laughs> out the window since having a baby. So her thing is that dad jokes are just, you know, taking over my mind right now. So if your dad jokes from me, I do apologize. They're probably not funny. If anything, you laugh at them for being not funny. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Prepare for more. Uh, from North Biznet, it was very nice to meet you at the Trader Expo in New York, by the way. Um, how do you see DXY price move inspect it affecting the S&P 500? Are we expecting near-term higher highs on USD weakness? So I don't trade them with a strong correlation. I look at them as completely separate markets. They do correlate from time to time. But they also, that correlation breaks. And so if I'm just trading overlay or if I'm just trading correlation, that opens up the very realistic prospect of me being right on the play, but being wrong on the trade. So in general, I try to avoid overlay or correlations unless it's like super tight, like CAD and oil will, will often be. Um, so my take on the dollar is a lot more clear, I think, than the S&P 500. The dollar is still in digestion, congestion, um, and we're in essence just waiting for a break, one direction or the other. It failed to break downside yesterday when it easily could have, and so that's what has me looking back on the long side of USD. The S&P 500, on the other hand, a bit different because we did uh, have extended or stretched up two fresh highs. Let me get one of these with a bit more annotation on it. 
And so there's basically just one way for me to look at this right now, and that's trying to catch a reversal because this is the only thing that I really have defined on the S&P 500 right now that could be workable. It's that high around 2850, 2853 that I could use for stop placement so the reversals might be able to play out. Support's too far away. I can't really justify a long position given the distance that it's already traveled today. Um, but, I, you know, again, I would be looking at them as as the separate markets. In essence, qualifying the S&P 500 as a trending market that's working with or resisting around a prior swing high, whereas the U.S. dollar is, I mean, it's still cotton congestion waiting to break out. <laughs> Uh, Dimitrios, and I'm really glad he asked this because this puts, this brings everything back home. Um, hi, James, aka the money maker. <laughs> Be careful with those, man. You don't want to, don't want to, don't want to give off too many signals. Uh, is it intentional you missed out on cable today? Was not. <laughs> I mean, I know it's currently probably too risky to trade due to the Brexit situation. Could you go through at least the short term setup, please? Thanks, man. First off, happy to do so for you. Um, the reason I left it off, it wasn't necessarily because I think it's it's too tricky to trade. It's just I have no feel for what this thing is doing. And it's, you know, going back to the question from Mr. Heath a little earlier where, you know, he was asking, are things just a little too wonky to be placing trades or taking on risk right now? Um, this is a market where I would qualify that, where like I would literally have zero underpinning in what's driving momentum here. And I would largely just be looking at fading levels. By fading levels, I mean, if support level comes into play, like we had around 130, okay, I can look at a long, reasonably tight stop. And then if that reversal holds, great. If it doesn't, get out quick because headlines are continuing to pummel this thing in either direction. But you could get a good idea of why I wanted to leave it off today. I mean, it's just, it looks like an electrocardiogram. You know, if you've ever seen an EKG, you know, this thing they have on TV when they, uh, you know, when they're measuring somebody's heart rate before they try to shock them back into life. Well, that's what this kind of looks like to me. Um, the most I would be able to do is try to plot, uh, try to plot support defense of the 130 big figure. Looking for price to move back up towards that 3087, 3117 zone. Let's go ahead and extend that on while we have it. Uh, after that, you know, resistance that 3181, 3187 area, that looks pretty good to me if it forms. But, you know, again, momentum is kind of an unpredictable thing here. So if prices just shoot through it, just wait for the move to stop, look to fade it again. You know, basically just looking to place swings in either direction for the sole purpose of risk management or being able to adequately manage my risk. Because I literally have no idea what's going on in short term um, for short term momentum or drivers here. But yeah, like Richard, he asked a little earlier, um, this would be one of those pairs that's a little bit too chaotic for me to actually think I could do anything well with it yet. Uh, from Preeti, uh, where will we find this recording? Uh, very good question. It is going to be right down here. And it's going to be about an hour and 10 minutes from now. I usually post these at 3 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, right there is where it'll show up. Daily Effects TV, which is just a little bit below what's called the fold on the site. The fold is right down here. I'm going to just go just below the fold. Daily Effects TV is going to show up right there. Uh, Mr. Vinnie Palma, good to see you, sir. James is away from the desk. Have you looked at OCN? Not getting any headway. Thoughts, please? I did not, no, sir. Um, and to be just completely transparent, I have not given this one a lot of attention at all so far this week, but let's see what we can do with it. Yeah, that's kaput, kaput, and kaput. Yeah, 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 that's the one I wanted. That fib retracement right there, that's a big one. Yeah, it's that 79.37 level. It's come back in a couple of different times. It's just really strong, really hard resistance.
Yeah, so the best I'd have on this one right now, Vinny, would basically just be to play range logic. You know, we scroll out here, I'm on a four hour chart. So in essence, going back to pretty much like mid-January, I think there's a trend line that could be found in here. There we go. It's fairly horizontal up there. So it feels like it's a little bit too far away from resistance for me to line anything up attractive right now. You know, those swing highs are more than 100 pips off current price, which I wouldn't be able to justify with a move back down towards support. But, you know, if we do see prices coming down into support, it looks like around sub 78, where it could be of interest for swings. You know, particularly if that trend line holds a fourth test. But at the very least, there's a couple of areas that I could look to right here for stop placement to put underneath the position so that if it does come back, then fantastic. I just look for range continuation. That'd be about the best that I have on it right now. Good resistance, though. Uh, from Tim Ham, hey James, what helps you get convicted to enter trades at those levels you're looking at, moving past analysis and getting in? I mean, I don't care if I lose. I don't. I mean, I think that trading in general is very difficult for a lot of people because fa failure is almost guaranteed. It is guaranteed if you're going to do this right. You're going to fail from time to time at least a little bit. And most people aren't comfortable with that. They can't embrace it. The smartest people I know have the most difficult time embracing failure. Or, or or something that doesn't work or when a system doesn't go as planned. So I think that there's only one way to offset that. It's experience, just failing a lot more. And the more you fail, the more you get, I don't want to say immune to it, but the more it kind of becomes standardized and it just pisses you off a little bit. And then you want to fight and you want to fix it so that it can't hit you again, you know? Um, but for triggering these things, it's very easy for me because it's systematic by and large. I have a couple of different ways that I enter into positions and I generally stick to those mannerisms. The first one, I talk about this one pretty often, the four hour trader, um, I'm in New York. So candle closes on the four hour chart from here at five, nine and one. And so what I'll do is I'll take a 10 minute window around each of those candle closes and I'll relegate that for swing trade, uh, for decision making on swing trades. So the setup isn't going to be perfect when I'm when I'm setting it in. It's based on how it looks within that 10 minute window after five, nine and one. But at that point, because I only have that 10 minute window for the next four hours to make a decision, it's, you know, make it happen or get out of the way. Right. Um, alternatively, my scalping strategy, which I keep on right down here. This is my preferred way of doing it. It's just what I have more experience doing. It allows me to manage my risk, control my risk a lot more, uh, a lot, a lot more tightly, just because how granular moves can get on like a five-minute chart. But like for instance, that euro-dollar move, right? So yesterday, tops out, pulls back, but it's almost like in slow motion the way that these moving averages get back in order, the way the bearish trend comes back. And then the way it just continues to reload for me. So in that one short side move, I could get five, six, or seven entries, each of which are going to cost me less than if I just placed it off the four-hour chart. But, I mean, I can't just watch five-minute charts all day long. I got a kid now, so I have to do, like, real life stuff sometimes. And that's where swing trading, the four-hour trader type of mentality comes in. My wife wants me to change a diaper. I'll just be like, hey, you know, just hold on 10 minutes. I'll be right back. She'll live with that. Me sitting down, watch five-minute chart peel she will not she will not be happy with um all right got five minutes left let's hustle 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 um from p 430 edt until u.s market opens sees uh tons of data easy us pmis boc and uh that i see anything but quiet my friend friday might be a strong work day at the desk i'm afraid need a long weekend after back and forth this week positive scalps only on one of my accounts and flat on the other Hey, flat ain't bad. Flat ain't bad. Neither is staying in cash. Both of those, not bad options. Better than losing. All 
Uh, from Joe Jawamaro. Uh, Hi, James. Couldn't listen to your notes on Euro Dollar. Do you believe that we will get back to 111.20 again? Or 112 again? Yeah, I mean, eventually. It's just a matter of whether it's now or two years from now. Um, I mean, so let me say this. I have no machinations of uh, an economic revivalry uh, within the Eurozone. I do not think that there's a good backdrop there. But I also think these longer-term macroeconomic forecasts could get quite a force from short-term price action, very similar to what happened in 2017 to 2018. At this stage, my trepidation for looking for the Euro to go back towards 112 would be the fact that buyers had responded so aggressively when, when we tested through it the first time. And that 112.12 Fibonacci level is one that I've been following for a while. Um, as it's like the 618 of the lifetime move in the euro, which coincidentally helped to cut off a bunch of candlestick bodies when it was ranging around in 2015, 2016. But can it? Absolutely. Things can change all the time. Like Pete said, we got more drivers coming out tonight. And if, if the past couple of days or the past couple of weeks are evidence of anything, it's that you need to expect the unexpected in this stuff because the expected thing doesn't always happen. It doesn't usually happen even. What usually happens is somewhere in between the expectation and I don't want to call it the black swan, but the unexpected. So just got to kind of remain humble and vigilant on either side of the argument, which is why many times I'll look at both sides of a setup or two sides of a setup. As opposed to just saying, oh, well, this is dollar yen, so it has to go up. No, this is dollar yen. If the dollar goes up, this is where I want to focus on it. If it doesn't, if it tanks, then cut bait, run, and look somewhere else. Uh, good comment here from Marina. Uh, I don't know why I cannot do scalping. That does not work for me. Th then do not do it. By all means, like, I think more than anything, you got to be comfortable with what you're doing for it to ever work. And if it's something where you're not comfortable, you're not going to want to do it. I mean, I remember when I was trading bonds, I had to do a, like a specific strategy. I was, I, I had, and I had no choice on it and I hated it. And so I hated going into work. Every day was uncomfortable. And then eventually it just kind of grates on you so that even if you're doing well or making good money, it just doesn't feel right. And you're not going to want to stick there for very long. And, you know, that's when I found out that money wasn't the only thing to me and that I wanted to actually have a bit more control over my fate, my destiny, if you will, and being able to choose how I was going to implement strategies and, and setups, et cetera. But, yeah, if it doesn't feel right, that's OK. It doesn't it doesn't have to be the only way of going about it. And that's one of the reasons that I'll often take these conversations only to a certain length. Like, I'm happy to show you the setups I'm looking at, the directions I'm looking, but I don't want to say, well, this is the way that it has to be entered because that's kind of like saying, well, you have to walk at the same speed that I'm walking. That might not be the best way for everybody. So I'm showing you what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, where I'm doing it, and then I'm sharing that with you so that you can make it your own, or trying to, at least. Uh, from Demetrios, you probably know by now, I'm more of a strategy person rather than setup specific. Read your articles on swing strategy and how to identify them through fractals. Will you be able to demo that a bit, please? Thanks a lot once again. Uh, first off, my pleasure. Um, but that's what this webinar was, <laughs> looking at swing trades all over the place, right? Uh, I think an important aspect of doing that is scenario planning and building strategy around singular variables. By singular variables, I mean there's so much that we don't know in a market that we have to really glom on and grasp the few things that we do know, right? And I think that the only thing that we do know for right now is the dollar is set to move and eventually break out of this impasse. Until then, we're likely to get a lot of back and forth price action until this thing finally picks a direction. But for something like that, that would mean I'd want to remain relatively balanced around the U.S. dollar. Now, cable, as we discussed, it's in a no-fly zone for me right now. Uh, Euro dollar, I could cut this one either way, right? So I'm not going to optimize the strategy based on that. I'm going to go to something else where I do have a bit more conviction. Let's say, say dollar you want. Okay, well, I could easily justify a short side setup here, stop above that 674 level, right? Now that gives me something that I could work off of. I'm looking for USD volatility, which means I probably want to look for a short setup. I want to look for a long setup. 
one two risk reward ratio on each that are roughly equidistant so that really all I need is the dollar to stretch in one direction or the other to plan for a decent probability of profit potential. I know I want to go short the dollar here because we've been in this bearish channel. We've had a strong yuan over the past few months. That could be a possibly workable theme. Now, what if the dollar gets really strong? Okay, well, my short side dollar yuan setup isn't going to work. I'm going to need something that's going to fill that in on the other side. Your dollar. We went over that swing setup a little bit earlier. Possibility of stops above that 114.48 Fibonacci level. A look at the profit targets about 100 to 150 pips below current prices. And now I can start to put that in as part of the strategy, right? And then I could move on. Okay, so I have one long USD setup, one short USD setup. I also looked at dollar Swiss. Reversal potential back up to the parity figure. I could line this one up on the long side of the US dollar as well. Or if I want to get really cute about it, hey, Europe and Switzerland, there's some correlation there. So let me instead plot for bearish scenarios here in dollar Swiss to take on some USD weakness. And then I'll look for something for USD strength, right? Maybe say like a reversal in gold or something along those lines. So at that point, I'm not even using my macro bias in that analysis. I'm just looking for ways to fit in one, two risk reward ratios across these swing setups off of levels remaining relatively balanced around the US dollar. So then invariably what I'm looking for in the dollar is I'm looking for a concerted directional run on a short term basis to clear off those profit targets that are designed to be twice my stop distances. Okay, so the last question of the day um, goes from Ryan Little. <laughs> well, hold on, I, there's one thing I need to point out. Maria says, I don't do it anymore. My heart is not strong enough. No, 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 no. I think the scalping is like kind of an extreme of trading, right? I don't think, I, I know that a lot of folks that come into markets think they have to scalp if they want to do this properly, but I equate it to driving. Like when you're learning to drive, you don't want to learn to drive going 100 on the on the freeway. You want to go into an empty parking lot or if you stall out, you're not going to hurt anybody. You know, so to make that analogy, that would be similar to looking at and basing decisions off of like the weekly or the daily chart. Sure, we get big movements still, you know, just like you can get an accident in a parking lot. But the factors are on your side for things to move a little bit slower, a little bit less aggressively. So looking at like a daily chart on a demo account or a no leverage type of arrangement, something along those lines. And then just like driving, as soon as you get comfortable driving around in that parking lot, you can speed things up a little bit. Okay, well, a four hour chart. Now we're gonna have more variables to deal with. Things are gonna move a little bit faster. We're gonna get mess, uh, we're gonna get in uh, error situations a little bit more often. Uh, we're gonna eat more stops. Right. We're going to get more resistance breaks, more support breaks. And then if we can work that, we can go even tighter on like the hourly chart. Now, if you get all three of these and you're still feeling good about yourself, then you go down to like a five minute chart. And that's when you can start to scalp. I think that's the way that folks need to do it if they want to learn how to scalp, because what I look at on a daily chart, it impacts what I'm doing on a five minute chart. They're inextricably linked. Um, now, getting back to Ryan's question, do you respect times and sessions when opening trades or just enter when the opportunity presents the setup? So, again, I have this rather systematized to a large degree. Uh, five, nine, and one are when my four-hour candles close. And that gives me like a 10-minute window at the close of each of those four-hour candles to react or respond to the way that, that candle had closed. So if on a four-hour candle close, I get a wick going through a support level, I could look at a stop underneath that wick, look for the reversal to play out. And if support doesn't hold, then I could get out rather relatively quick. If it does hold, when I look at it four hours later, okay, great. Stop up to break even. See if I get a little bit more. So in, in that system, opening and closings are entirely system uh, systematized based upon four hour candle closes. When I'm scalping or doing short term, anything short term, it's largely when I'm going to have my finger on the trigger for the next few hours so that I can actually manage the risk off and get that stop to break even. Rarely will I ever leave the matter with my initial stop still exposed. I'll usually try to get that stop cinched up or I might even kill off the position early if it's not working. 
Wow. Okay, so this is uh, totally egotistical, but Russ Johnson just asked me a great question that uh, stokes my ego a little bit. So, well, of course, I'll, I'll finish on this one today. James, you are such a good webinar presenter. Is there a special place where IG wants to keep all of the recordings of webinars hid hidden? Uh, when I try to find a recent webinar like Chris Vecchio from 3AM, I cannot find it for the life of me. Why make it hard to find the current 24 to 48 hour webinar recordings? That is a really good question, Russ. So I do think that we have something in the works right now to try to make that a little easier because YouTube has become a huge part of the site over the past couple of years. It used to be, I remember when we were having conversations, well, should we put content on YouTube? Because it just makes it free for everybody. Um, now the solution that I'm going to provide to you here, it's not ideal. And I'm gonna apologize in advance, but it's the only way I know of to accomplish what you're looking for with a minimum of, of, of hassle. Uh, you can just type in YouTube daily effects in Google, that'll take you right to our YouTube channel. Alternatively, if you're on Google, you could just type in daily effects and it'll bring you right there. There's a handsome gentleman or half of his head at least, <laughs> but there we go, daily effects. And then you click on that, that'll bring you into all of the webinars that we do have. And so um, market news, currency trading news, but these are gonna be the most recent webinars. Uh, if you're looking for one from Chris, he may not have posted it yet, but I do know that those usually go up. Ah, there it is. Nope, that was from three days ago. But yeah, the Daily Effects YouTube feed is gonna have all of the videos that we posted. Ah. My man, Pete. Uh, Marina asked even the old ones. Yeah, yeah. There's really old stuff in there. All right, folks. I got to cut it now because somebody else needs to use the webinar room. But I just want to say thank you so much, everybody, for your time. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day. I'll be back online uh, next week, Tuesday and Thursday. Hope you have the time to visit with me again. But thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. And as always, happy trading.